Hey everyone, and welcome back to the channel. While Suricata shines at capturing live traffic at high speeds, did you know it can also analyze pre-recorded network data? Today, we're taking a deeper dive into Suricata's replay mode, which is Suricata's ability to replay network traffic from PCAP files. This lets you load individual PCAP files for focused analysis of specific network events and process entire directories of PCAPs one after another while maintaining flow state across files. Imagine this. Suricata analyzing pre-recorded traffic, generating alerts, and providing insights just like it's examining live activity on your network. That's the power of PCAP Replay. Throughout this video, we'll show you how to read PCAP files for powerful security analysis. So get ready to take your Suricata skills to the next level. Don't forget, Suricata is powered by open source and your support makes all the difference. Please take a moment and hit that like and subscribe button to help grow our community. Okay, let's get started. So today's focus is on processing PCAPs with Suricata, and it's actually really quick and straightforward to do. Here we're looking at Suricata's help information, and the only argument we really need to focus on right now is dash R. That is PCAP file or offline mode. This argument will expect a value, which is the path to a PCAP file, either a PCAP file itself, or Suricata has the ability to be pointed to a directory and then recursively process all PCAPs in that directory. Now, I have found over the years that working with PCAPs and Suricata is a little bit easier if we, if we facilitate it with a bash script. So with this script, it's just going to do a few things for us. First, we're going to have one argument, and that's going to be the location of our PCAP file. The second thing it does is it defines a custom log location. Now, the reason that we're doing this is because if we don't create a specific log location for the PCAP file, then by default, Suricata is going to use the log location in the configuration file. And if for some reason you're processing PCAP and Suricata is running live on the system, then there can be some collision in that log file and the data from our PCAP processing will start to overwrite and maybe even run into some resource contention with those log files that Suricata is using as it's running as a service. So it's not only good to define that log location in another place, another location in the file system, it's also quite helpful that when we want to analyze PCAPs to really just kind of have our own Suricata analysis system for it. And that's, that's typically what I do. Now, there isn't going to be a lot of robust checking here. The first conditional is just going to check that the PCAP file exists. The second conditional will then look at where you've pointed or define that log location, and it will try to create it. Now, a second important note with this is that if we continue to use, even in this PCAP mode or this offline mode, the same log location, Suricata will begin to append to those log files. That means that we'll have data that will start to accumulate over all of the PCAPs that we analyze. Now, that might be something that you desire, but oftentimes if I'm analyzing a PCAP, I just want to have data from that one particular PCAP file. I don't wanna get confused. So as you can see with this script, this is going to delete using an RF command, everything in that log location, every time it runs. The last two elements of this script is the Suricata command itself. As you can see, we have a few arguments here, but the important ones again are dash R with the dollar one variable. Dollar one variable re represents the argument to the script. So that's going to be the location to the PCAP file and dash L will define a new log location. So that's going to override the log location from the Suricata.yaml file. Once this command runs, Suricata will generate all of its data, particularly in the eve.json file. So the last part of the script will print out the alerts. Now, this is going to use grep to grep the event type of alert from the eve.json file and then redirect that to a utility called jq. That eve.json file is json data, json structured data. So jq is just a really helpful utility that allows you to explore data in that json file. Now you probably noticed here that with this particular query, it's only printing out the alerts. I wanna stress as I will throughout this video that Suricata will produce data regardless of alerts. Alerts are just another data type, an event type that you'll find in the eve.json file. So the first PCAP we're gonna look at won't actually generate alerts. And I'll show you though that there is still a tremendous amount of valuable data there for us to explore. Um, you'll also see the last command in this script is for evebox. And we'll get to evebox later in the uh, video series. But as you'll see here in this video, while grepping and, and querying the eve.json file with things like utilities like jq is really powerful, it can also be a little bit more time consuming. 
So Evebox is a web-based graphical interface that really wraps itself around Suricata data and makes it easier to investigate and explore. All right, before we start processing PCAPs, you might want to just take a moment and consider the rule sets that you have enabled. We talked about rule sets in one of the previous videos, so we're not going to get into all the details here. I am going to use Suricata Update with the List Enable Sources command just to show you that I have two sources enabled, the Hunting Rules from Travis Green and ET Open. All right, now we can use that script to start processing PCAP. And the only thing we need is the script to be executable and the location of our PCAP file. So I have both of these located in the same directory. You'll see you get some output here from the script itself saying, hey, I found the log location, just gonna delete that previous content. And now Suricata is running in offline mode. Now I have ET open as a rule set enabled. And if you looked, you know, go back to that last video where we talked a little bit more about that, there's quite a few rules that are going to be enabled by default. Uh, 30 or uh, 30 some thousand or so, if I remember sort of correctly, I'm in the ballpark anyway. Uh, so this means that while Suricata is running, you know, there's kind of two things that might in impact performance right now, the size of the PCAP that we're processing, and then the number of rules that it has to load before it can begin to analyze that traffic. Okay, once it's done, you'll see information about the processing of the PCAP. In particular, it's telling us that it read one file, 910 packets, and 426,216 bytes. So I kind of use that as a sanity check just to make sure that yes, indeed, um, I gave it a PCAP file. I don't, you know, I didn't probably look, I didn't look at how large the PCAP file was, but generally speaking, that seems right. It read some data. You know, if it said it read a data, if it said it read one file, but then no packets and no bytes, there would be something wrong and I'd want to troubleshoot that. And the next thing, of course, is that we have no alerts, that the JQ command along with grep that you saw in that script, it did look into the eve.json file, but it didn't find any alert data. So let's navigate to the location of our log file. You'll see there's our eve.json. And I'm just gonna work through a few basic commands here just to show you that there is still very valuable data that was produced regardless of whether or not alerts were there. Um, this video is about processing PCAPs though, so we're not gonna get into all of the details here in the eve.json file. I'm gonna save that for a future session, but this will start, I think, to show you the, the basics and some of the structure here and of course some of the value. So we can run JQ, provide it with um, the eve.json file, and if we just give it a dot, you'll see what it essentially did was it, I'm just gonna scroll back here to a, a somewhat arbitrary location until I, I find some information here that I, I wanna show you, here we go. Um, so it's just essentially taken that eve.json file and formatted it in a way that's a little bit easier for us to digest. Here you can see the structure, every record in this file is gonna be an event type, and that event type, then we can we can investigate that. We can see all of the different event types that have been recorded for, in this case, the processing of the PCAP. You can also use this then to better understand not only the data that Suricata has captured, but the structure of these records, which allows us to explore that in a little more detail. Okay, so what do I mean by that? Well, if we use JQ, we can query the event type out of the eve.json file, we can sort it, and then we could just look for unique values. And this will show you then that from that PCAP file, we have DNS, file info, flow, HTTP, stats, and TLS event records. So this was all network data that was produced by Suricata in processing that PCAP. And, and this is going to be the same type of data you're going to get when Suricata is listening to live traffic in its service mode. Okay, I didn't give you much background on the PCAP. The PCAP, and we'll make sure to provide a link to the PCAP in the video description here, but the PCAP came from um, any run, and it definitely was from a malicious document that downloaded some additional payloads. But oftentimes when we're investigating traffic, we don't necessarily know the whole story. We're, we're investigating the traffic to try to uh, uncover patterns of suspicious or malicious activity. So with the event records that we have above, uh, HTTP definitely stands out, TLS stands out, and then of course DNS. Well, likely if there was an HTTP request or TLS session that was established, then there was a DNS query before that. So we'll use the select command with JQ to identify information about DNS. Now, essentially what that did was allowed us to look at the event record type just for DNS. And so what you see here in, the, in our, our terminal is all of the data, all of the, the, you know, the properties for the DNS event type record. 
Well, we also now have all of the DNS queries, and we might not be particularly interested in queries to windowsupdate.com. So we can now take the understanding of the structure and refine our query a little bit further. Say I want to get just the unique values from the RR name field under DNS. And now we can see very quickly all the values that were, que that were queried. And two values at the top almost immediately jump out as a bit odd, at least suspicious in my mind, considering the context. We have j.mp and then I know you didn't like me.blogspot.com. Okay, so what do we do with that information? Well, I'm going to make an assumption that at least one of those domains were used to make the initial or to make an HTTP request. And I would suspect just based off of the, the order of events that j.mp is that host. So let's modify our select statement now to look at just HTTP records. Very similar. If we're not familiar with this, the structure of this event type, we can just query all HTTP events. Now I can see, okay, we've got, you know, timestamp, source IP, dest IP. We have HTTP specific fields such as hostname, URL, user agent. And this allows us to better understand the structure. What we can do with this, maybe we take our query um, and we make it conditional. We say, okay, I want to select everything that has a host name equal to j.mp. And now if we run that query, we get results. And not only do we get results, but you can see that in under the HTTP properties, we have not only the host name of the URL, so that would be the, the full you know, URL that was requested, but you'll see there's also a redirect value. And the redirect was to HTTPS, I know you didn't like me.blogspot.com slash p slash ice2.html. So that was a redirect. And that means that not only, you know, we don't have any HTTP response content here to investigate, this also redirected to an HTTPS session. So it, it initiated a TLS session for this redirected value, which means that whatever happens next, Suricata isn't going to be able to decrypt the content between or in that session. Well, we had TLS event records, right? So now that kind of makes even more sense. You know, likely there was, there was TLS traffic just from probably the, the system that was utilized to run these malicious artifacts and, and capture the network traffic. Um, we now know that we have at least one, you know, one suspicious TLS session. So instead of going through all the TLS records, you could do that. I'm just going to select the subject. And now we have some subjects, um, blogspot.com and blogger.com, which is, I believe, a legitimate service. So it makes it a little bit harder at this point because, you know, it's, we're going to have to be able to differentiate between malicious and non-malicious requests. However, you may find in your network that there aren't a lot of folks that are going to blogspot.com or blogger.com, as well as, as just the fact that you could scope your investigation and the relevance of this indicator based off of time. So you have some options. Um, the last bit of information here, just you know, slightly more complex query to show you that we can now you know, continue to refine, continue to, to kind of pinpoint on the data that Suricata has generated by, you know, filtering off of the TLS subject. We'll look for just values that contain blog, and then we'll get the entire event record type. So here's an example. Now you can see all of the information you have around gener you know, data that Suricata generated for those TLS records. Not only do you have the subject, but you have things like issuer, fingerprints, um, expiration, we have JA3, JA3S hashes as well. So these are additional pieces of information that can help you to generate, you know, useful network indicators. Okay. So that was investigating some traffic from a PCAP without any alerts. I'm going to navigate back to the location of where I have my, in my, uh, Suricata script and my next PCAP file. So this one we're going to run very similar to the previous. Now it's deleted all of the log data from that previous run, and it's going to just generate log data from this PCAP file. So our results are quite a bit different here. Uh, again, we can sanity check on the, the, you know, the PCAP file, Circata says it read one file, quite a few more packets here. So a lot more activity in this particular PCAP. Um, and uh, we certainly can see the alerts below. So we know that along with all of the other protocol data that Suricata generated, 
Now, that event type, we have specific alerts. So quite a bit happens here. It's going to be chronological, so you can start to read through these alerts to kind of build a story of what happened. And very similar to how we explored that last PCAT file, now we can go to the location where our log file is, or we could just update our JQ command to use an absolute path. Uh, well, I guess we're relative as well. Um, but we can now select just the alert data. And you'll see that we have, again, these event records, and all of the data is here for us to investigate. So we have you know information. It's particular to alerts, such as metadata and flow bits. We have alert and the alert record itself, such as the signature and the category. And then, of course, all of the relevant protocol and flow data that was responsible for this alert to be generated. But again, don't worry about if you're not real familiar about all the ins and outs of the, the data structures uh, used by you know the eve.json file and the alerts. That's content we'll get to here in future videos. Right now, I just really wanted to show you not only can Suricata process PCAPs just like it's running in, in live mode, um, but there is a lot of data that's being generated whether alerts are there or not. Uh, the last thing that I wanted to show you is just the timestamp. So by default, what Suricata will do when it's processing PCAP files is it utilizes the same timestamp that was in the PCAP. So if you're doing any searching or querying or any tools that allow you to ingest this data and then search through it like a SIM, the original timestamp is from when the PCAP was captured. So you have to keep that in mind, especially if any of your queries are going to be time-based. Okay, that's all we have. Hope you enjoyed the video and learned a little bit more about Suricata. Don't forget to like and subscribe to this video. And if you have questions, not only are comments open, but you can check out the forums, the Suricata forums, to go in and get help and converse with other Suricata users. Until the next video, take care.